Well, good morning, everyone, and thank you for coming, and trust that the Lord will encourage us from His Word this morning. I'd like you to turn with me in your Bibles to 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy and chapter 4, 2 Timothy 4 and verse 5 is the verse we want to read, but maybe just for connection, let's begin in verse 1. This is the last letter of the Apostle Paul to his uh, friend Timothy, co-worker Timothy, man that he had invested much into his, Timothy's life. And so we read in verse 1, I charge thee, this is a, a solemn charge, as it were, given to Timothy. I charge thee before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick or the living and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom, Preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. But watch thou in all things endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. Now, I want to think this morning with you about this idea of doing the work of an evangelist. And uh, one of the things in this little section that we saw was the, the charge Paul gives to Timothy to preach the word. And he tells him to do it in season and out of season. And the implication is that uh, there, there are different seasons. We're just entering in to the, uh, the, what we call the fall season, and, uh, uh, or autumn if you're from the British Isles, uh, and uh, uh, the seasons are changing, and it's getting colder, and the leaves are falling, and all the rest of it. So, so seasons change. By the way, who's in control of the seasons changing? God, right? He's the one that does that. We can't affect that at all. It's nothing to do with us. It's what he does. So he says, preach the word in season and out of season. And the implication is that there are times when it's in season, uh, times when it seems like people are really responsive to the gospel, times when it seems like uh, God is moving and, and things are happening. And there's been times like that through history. The 70s in this country, a lot of people came to Christ in the 1970s, the Jesus movement. The hip, it was an in-season time. The 1800s, tremendous ingathering of souls in the 1800s, the 1859 revival, Moody in the 1880s. I mean, it was like an in-season time. But I think most of us would agree that right now, it seems to be a bit of an out-of-season time, right? We get excited, at least in, in the Western world, we get excited if we hear of one person saved, where it seems like when it's in-season, people come, as it were, by flocks to Jesus Christ, rather than ones and twos. But Paul says, you don't worry about the season, you just keep preaching the Word, doesn't matter what it is. And the thing is that if you keep on preaching the Word, you never know exactly when the season will change. You see, if you, if you quit because you say, well, you know what, it's not a good season, I'm gonna quit right now, you might miss that precious moment when God changes the seasons. I know an assembly in the north of Ireland, and every Sunday night, uh, they have a gospel service, and uh, they work hard to try and get people to come uh, to hear the gospel, and, uh, and, and uh, they've, they get people coming out, but they went through a phase of 10 years where all their efforts and nothing seemed to happen. And you'd think, oh, well, after 10 years, maybe we should just try something different, right? But they kept on, and year 11, which was just a couple of years ago, every Sunday night, for a whole year, somebody got saved in that little assembly. They are really thankful they didn't quit year 10. <laughs> and that's what 
Paul is saying, to Tim, you keep on preaching the word. You leave the change of the seasons to me. I'll change the seasons. You just preach the word. But you better be preaching the word when the season changes, right? Because if you're not, you'll miss the harvest. And so he says, preach the word. Then he goes on in, the, in uh, our passage, the verse, our verse particularly, he says, uh, watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist. I want to think about this idea of enduring afflictions. Maybe one of the reasons why personal evangelism, aggressive evangelism is not so popular today is that we're a bunch of wimps and we don't want to endure afflictions. We don't even like rejection, right? I don't like it and I knock on somebody's door and they are rude to me because I'm there as an ambassador of Jesus Christ and they slam the door in my face and I just feel like I want to crawl up in a ball and cry. You know, I mean, I'm such a wimp it, compared to previous generations. I was sharing with some of the uh, people the other day that uh, John Wesley... Wherever he went to preach the gospel in the British Isles in the early days, there were mobs waiting for him with stones. And they would throw rotten tomatoes, stones, uh, all kinds of stuff at him and his preachers. Because it wasn't just him. There was a whole army of Methodist evangelists that preached. And uh, he went through a time phase in his life where um, nobody threw anything at him for quite some time. And he began to wonder, Lord, what am I doing wrong? Am I out of the will of God? Is there something wrong? And so one day he got off his horse and he was on his knees praying to the Lord and examining his heart and he's saying, Lord, am I sinning? Why is nobody throwing anything at me anymore? And a mob saw him and started throwing stones at him. One of them hit him and he said, oh, thank you, Lord. And <laughs> I'm back in fellowship. Now, that just seems like, like almost fantasy to us. What I've just told you almost seems like fantasy, doesn't it? It's so foreign to our culture, and I'm talking about the Christian culture, right? And again, I'm not, I'm not somebody who's going out there wanting people to throw stones at me or anything like that. That's ridiculous. And, and there are people that it's their, it's their own foolishness, but, but this is for the, for the cause of Christ. He says, endure afflictions. There's going to be rejection. But there's also Paul, wherever Paul went, there was a riot and there was a revival. Almost, if you read the book of Acts, almost every place he went, there was a riot and there was a revival. We don't want the riot, but we never see the revival either, right? Because we're not willing to go out there and endure afflictions. And then he says, do the work of an evangelist. I like that idea, work. In other words, what he's saying is, if you're really going to be an effective evangelist, it, it, it means work, right? You've got to get out there and actually do the work. And it is work. And it is work to go out and share the gospel with other people. And, and, and it is effort, and, and it's a strenuous effort, and it can be tiring. Uh, when we were down in Georgia knocking on doors for this gospel campaign, uh, it, we, 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 we couldn't get out too early because you know, people weren't up. And so we'd go at 10 o'clock. And uh, it was only, we were there, uh, it's kind of like end of April, beginning of May, and uh, by the time we got to noon, it was hot and steamy, and we were just sweating, just walking from one door to another. And it was work, right? It's, it's kind of, it is work to do. So he says, do the work of an evangelist. And so I want to think about what does it mean, uh, this idea of doing the work of an evangelist? What does it really mean? Uh, to do the work of an evangelist. Now, and just a, a, a very helpful verse. I want you to turn with me, uh, please, to 1 Peter. 1st Epistle of Peter in chapter 3. And uh, there's a very interesting text here, uh, which I find very, very important in uh, how to be effective in doing the work of an evangelist. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to kind of break this text down, 1 Peter 3.15, and I'm going to break it down into six little parts and, uh, and spend time kind of mulling over and meditating on each part of this verse. 
And so let's just read the verse to begin with. Uh, 1 Peter 3, verse 15, it says, Sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Let me read that again. Sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. So what does that, exactly does this phrase mean? Sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. Other translations put it this way. Uh, one, the Net Bible uh, says this, but set Christ apart as Lord in your hearts. Set Christ apart as Lord in your hearts. And there's some thought that this verse that Peter is quoting is actually really a quotation from the book of Isaiah. And so I want to go back to Isaiah just for a second. Isaiah chapter 8 where we have uh, the phrase that perhaps was in Peter's mind as he writes to the saints uh, of his day. Isaiah 8 and verse 13, where it says this, Sanctify the Lord of hosts himself, and let him be your fear, let him be your dread. Sanctify the Lord of hosts himself. Let him be your fear. Let him be your dread. And so Peter takes this idea up of sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. And uh, I want to suggest to you, again, one of just a little uh, affirmation, by the way, of the deity of Christ, the Lord of hosts in the Old Testament, quoted by Peter as none other than our Savior, the Lord Jesus. Set Jesus apart, really, as Lord in your hearts. And I think it's a great, one of the great, uh, one of the great evidences of who the Lord Jesus is. And I want to suggest perhaps one of the reasons that we have a lack of evangelistic zeal in the day in which we find ourselves is that there's a lack of people setting Jesus apart as Lord in their hearts. In other words, it comes down to the practical Lordship of Christ. Is he Lord, unreserved master of your life? That's a good question to ask, isn't it? Is he Lord of your life? And if he is Lord of your life, Jesus would say this to you from Luke 6, 46. Why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not do the things that I say? That's a great question, isn't it? It's easy to say Jesus is Lord, and, and of course, we love to sing that, right? And we love to, a lot of the hymns talk about that, and it just kind of flows off the tongue. But what he's saying is, if I really am your Lord, how come you don't obey me? How come you don't do what I commanded you to do? What kind of a Lord am I if you won't take seriously my command? And what did the Lord tell us to do? Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, right? So, so don't call me Lord if you're not going to uh, gonna obey me, if you're not going to do the very, the very uh, commission that I have given to you. You will not do it. Why are you calling me Lord? And um, the word sanctify uh, in the King James here, uh, it has the, the idea of, of holy or to be set apart. And so the idea is that I am setting apart myself to obedience to him. That's what I'm doing. I want to set apart my, my life, my, all I am in obedience to him. And I want to suggest to you, actually, because this verse says, sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be always ready to give an answer to every man that asks you a reason of the hope that is within you. And the implication is that people should be asking us the reason for the hope that is within us. Now, is that happening? Are people coming up to you and saying, what is it about you? Can I ask you, what is it that makes you different, right? 
I mean, the implication is that people are coming up and asking, hey, what is it about you? And it could be that the reason people are not coming up and asking us is that we haven't set Jesus apart as Lord of our lives and we really live very little different lives to anybody else. So why would they ask us, right? Because you're just like me, right? And it's true, the divorce rate among Christians, guess what, same as unbelievers. Pornography use amongst Christians, same as unbelievers. And I could go on and on. Uh, you know, we are not living differently than them, so why should they ask us? And so maybe the, the issue of evangelism, and I forget, oh, it was Chris mentioned last night about uh, Ron Hampton saying at the conference in Winnipeg that he spoke it on evangelism. He said, if you'd have been speaking on prophecy, the place would be packed. But because you're speaking on evangelism, there's nobody. Why? Why would that be? Because if we really had set Jesus apart as Lord in our lives, we would be so interested in the Great Commission that any help we could get to fulfill it, we'd be there. We'd sign up, right? If he really was Lord of, of our lives. And so again, we got to ask the question, and let's make it real personal today, because I really don't care about giving out information. We're full of information. Our notebooks are full, our libraries are full, but our hearts are unbowed to the claims of Jesus Christ. And what I'm concerned is about transformation. So we need to ask the question today, all of us, preacher as well as hearers, could I honestly say that I have set apart Jesus as Lord of my life? Have you done that? You know, this would be a great day to do it, wouldn't it? It'd be a great day to get alone with God, maybe at the break, and just say, Lord, I've called you Lord, but I'm not really doing what you tell me to do. I'm actually living a life where I am really master. I'm living to please myself. And I repent of my self-centered, egocentric, centric, preoccupied life. And I want to give you your place. Does he deserve that place? Does the Lord Jesus deserve our absolute allegiance? Of course he does. Does he not? He's done so much for us. I told you a little bit last night about um, my conversion. Not too much, but I, I met somebody at work, and as well as uh, it was a girl, just in, so you don't want to be clear on this, and as soon as I saw her, I said, I'm going to marry her. I absolutely knew she was the one for me. But it wasn't just that she was a very beautiful woman, but I knew there was something different about her. And I remember thinking to myself, whatever she's got, I want it. Isn't that interesting? See, I was one of those people that asked somebody the question, what is the reason for the hope that's within you? And, and what I'm saying is that if more of us would live out the practical lordship of, of Christ in our lives, more people would be coming and asking us, what is it about you? How come you are so different? They would be asking. They would see a difference. Because we are being watched, by the way. We are being watched all the time. And especially if you make the pronouncement that you're a Christian, your life is under scrutiny in their watching. What do they see? Oh Lord, help him. Help me to be a good ambassador for the Lord Jesus. Don't allow anything in my life to be used as an excuse for their rejecting you. You know that kind of statement? If that person's a Christian, I don't want to be one. And you know the biggest reason people don't come to Christ today? The hypocrisy of the church. What's their number one statement? You Christians are a bunch of hypocrites. Do they have any validity in saying that? I think they do, don't they? And again, it's because we're not really living these set-apart lives under the complete lordship of the Lord Jesus, and maybe we need to kind of do business with God today ourselves and say, I want to be as holy as it's possible for a saved sinner to be, 
I want to be the best ambassador for the Lord Jesus that I can be. And I want to have you as the undisputed authority in my life. I'm tired of running my own show because it never works out so good, does it, when you're running your own show. <clears throat> I want you to be in charge. And so going back to our text, sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. And the next thing he says is be always ready. Uh, it used to be those batteries, I guess, what you call ever ready. Remember that? That's what we should be, ever ready. If we're going to do the work of an evangelist, we should be always ready to give an answer. Paul was an ever-ready Christian. I like that. He really was ever-ready. Uh, Romans chapter 1, let me just read that to you. Romans 1 verse 15 and 16, uh, where he tells us very clearly in Romans 1 15, so as much as is in me is, I like that statement, as much as in me is, like me say, put it this way, uh, uh, with every fiber of my being would be another way of putting it, as much as in me is, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It's the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. And so what he says, I'm always ready. I'm always ready to preach the gospel. In fact, every fiber of my being is geared up almost like a clock wound up kind of thing. Everything about me is bound up with this idea that I am constantly ready to preach the gospel. And so he says we should be ready. And we should be ready to give an answer. By the way, it's interesting. He says, I want to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. Who's he writing to in Rome? Who's he writing to? The church. And what's he want to preach to them? The gospel. Isn't that interesting? The book of Romans is the finest exposition of the gospel you will find anywhere, and it was written to a church. And I, I know that there's a sense in which um, Christians need teaching, and I, I, I know they need teaching. But listen, if we don't teach the gospel, nobody will know how to share it, right? When I first got saved... Uh, uh, saved at home apart from any church but when I first started going to an evangelical Bible preaching church it just so, so happened that at that time they were having a gospel campaign and I was a new Christian and I, would, I heard men preach the gospel in the power of the Holy Spirit. And I, I remember one guy speaking one night on Nicodemus and when he was talking about the wind blows where it wills you could feel the breeze. It was so powerful. It was incredible. I remember thinking to myself, boy, if I wasn't saved, <clears throat> I'd get saved tonight. And I said that every night. It was wonderful. And you know what, why it was so good to me, uh, that series of gospel services? It had such a confirming effect on my faith as newly saved out of Catholicism. All of a sudden, I'm getting this constant affirmation and confirmation that I've done the right thing, that this is, is the right message, that it's absolutely, and not only was it confirming, you know what else about it was? It helped me to share the gospel with others, because I heard men give tremendous illustrations about the gospel that I still use to this day in my own preaching. It's amazing. And so I, I, we do need teaching, and I'm, that's what I, I do. I do a lot of Bible teaching, and I love teaching the Scriptures. But, but listen, if we're supposed to preach the whole counsel of God, that has to include the core message of the gospel, right? That should be preached at some point, right? It, it should be preached, and, and we, we, we need to uh, be aware of that. I realize we've got to go out with the gospel, but, but we also, to go out with it, I have to know it, right? I've got to know what I'm going out with. I've got, to, I've got to be able to articulate it. I've got to be able to reason with it. And so we need to teach people the gospel and preach the gospel so that people can go out with it. And they have a message to give. But I want you to just think about this word ready. Be always ready to give an answer. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> of course, if you, if you wait 
till you feel like you're ready, you'll never go, right? And to give an answer, that word answer is the Greek word apologia, from which we get apologetics, right? And sometimes we, we, we feel like, um, well, it, you know, if I go out and share the gospel and somebody asks me an awkward question, I won't know what to say, so I better study apologetics before I can go and preach the gospel. And uh, apologetics has its place. Don't, don't get me wrong, it really does. But listen, if you wait till you're Ravi Zacharias before you preach the gospel and share it with somebody else, guess what? You'll never get there, All right? And let me just give you a little side here. Apologetics has never brought a revival, ever. Preaching the gospel in simplicity and power has been used of God to bring awakenings. Let me go a step further. And back in the 1800s, the Church of England were concerned about the growing <coughs> um, uh, unbelief uh, in the nation, and they arranged what they called the Bampton Lectures. And they would have these lectures on university campuses or parish churches that were in universities. And they were, they were kind of, the, the whole purpose of these Bampton Lectures was to, to give kind of a defense of historic biblical Christianity. And so they'd have all these, uh, these bishops and these Anglican clerics, and they would be evangelical, they believed the Word of God, and they would be giving these great defenses of the faith. And it had no impact whatsoever on the infidelity of the British Isles. D.L. Moody, this shoe clerk from Massachusetts, came to the British Isles, uneducated, filled with the Spirit of God, preached the gospel, and multitudes were one to the Savior, including deep skeptics. And so all I'm saying is apologetics has got its place, and it wouldn't harm us to, to do a brief course in apologetics and be able to defend uh, some of the, uh, the fundamentals of the faith. That would be very helpful, um, you know, and, and I see a place for that, but, but I have to say it's not going to win the nation. It's not going to win the nation. What's going to win the nation is the gospel. The gospel is the power of God, unto salvation. Not my intellect, not my ability to defend concepts. That's not going to win hearts. And, and when you're asked a question, you can't answer it. You know the best way to deal with that? Say, that's a great question. I've never heard that before. Uh, thank you. But, but, but let me tell you this. God loves you. Christ died for you, right? In other words, get straight back to the gospel. And, and it's not you ignore that. You go and you try and get that answer so that if you ever asked it again, you can, you can, you can answer that. But at the same time, you, you can't possibly know every answer to every question of every skeptic. You can't. Right? You know, Rabbi Zacharias is, there are not that many of them out there. And you can't be one. But what you can be is a, an ordinary believer who lives under the Lordship of Christ, who depends on the Holy Spirit, who gives them the gospel of Jesus Christ. And God can use that powerfully in somebody's life to win them to the Savior. And so he says, be ready. <clears throat> be ready. It's a mindset. It's not so much as um, <clears throat> knowing every answer to every question. <clears throat> um, it, it, it's, a, it's a mindset of just being ready. I, I just want to share this message. I'm looking for opportunities. I go out with tracks in my pocket. I go out with that mindset that, Lord, open a door. Uh, give me an opportunity to speak of the Savior today. I, I, I want to share this message with somebody and, and, and prayerfully go uh, in that mentality, that mindset praying for boldness to speak in his name. Look at Acts chapter 4 just for a second. Uh, Acts chapter 4 is an example of that, uh, where the apostles had been told not to speak in the name of Jesus, and uh, they'd been uh, told that uh, if they would do that, they would be imprisoned, and there'd be all kinds of consequences. Uh, but in verse 29, the church came together, and they had a prayer meeting. 
about this threat that hung over their heads. And they said uh, in verse 29, And now, Lord, behold their threatenings, and grant to thy servants that with all, all boldness they may, they may speak thy word. Verse 31 says, When they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together. They were filled with the Holy Ghost, and they spoke the word of God with boldness. And it would be a good idea for us to pray as we go about our business to pray for boldness to be able to speak about our Savior. Lord, would you give me boldness? So this, this mindset of readiness doesn't really come naturally to us. Often we're just preoccupied with living. Um, I, I spend a lot of time in airports, and all I can think about most of the time is getting to my gate and getting my flight. And all around me, there are souls. And my mind is, I gotta get to the gate, right? And, and I need to change that mindset to say, Lord, do you have any opportunities for me to speak of your son in this airport? Uh, I, I, can you give me some appointments, uh, divine appointments? Can you open doors? So the, the mindset doesn't come naturally to us. And we need to pray the Lord would change us and to give us a mindset for the gospel. And um, <clears throat> one, of the, one of the reasons perhaps we, we're not minded that way uh, could be that we're, we're just, we don't really have a compassion for lost souls like we should. Again, we're just, we're just living, busy, got to get here, got to do that, got to, and, and by the way, you can become busy doing the work of the church and forget about the multitudes, right? Like you can spend all your life keeping the machinery of the church going and never speak to a soul about the Savior. Very subtle, isn't it? Think you're doing the will of God and serving God. And of course, the church is, we said last night, vitally important to God. He doesn't have a plan B. I love the church. Christ loves the church, more importantly. I, but, but at the same time, he also loves the world. And he loves the lost. And we need a mind like our Savior. Look at Matthew 9, 36. This is the mind of the Lord Jesus. This is his mindset. And this is the kind of mindset we need. And uh, we need help with this. Lord, help us in this area. Matthew 9, 36. <clears throat> it says, but when he saw the multitudes, when Jesus saw the multitudes, and again, I, I think when I see the multitudes, what do I see? They're in my way, right? When he saw the multitudes, it says he was moved, moved with compassion. And he saw them as sheep. He says, he moved compassion on them because they were fainted, were scattered abroad, and he saw them as sheep having no shepherd. Some friends of mine uh, has, have, are attending a funeral today of their firstborn son, and uh, just was speaking on the phone with the brother, and he was talking about, he said, I've always known that God is the God of all comfort. But he says, I know it in a way that I've never known before, right? Unsafe people lose their firstborn sons too, but they don't have a shepherd. They have to face cancer, job loss, the disappointments of life, and they have no shepherd. They have to tough it out alone, right? And the Lord Jesus saw them. And he saw the multitudes with all their cares and all their hurts and all their aches. And, and it says he, it moved him with compassion because he says, they don't have a shepherd. And guess who wants to be their shepherd? The Lord Jesus wants to be their shepherd, doesn't he? Oh, and there's no better shepherd than him. And, and my friend uh, this morning as he spoke with me, he says, oh, what a, what a shepherd I have. Right? The reality of it is there in the, the crucible of life, the trials of life, 
having someone there who's a shepherd and the multitudes do not have that. So be ready to give an answer. And again, the problem is that sometimes in our uh, mentality, uh, you know, I can't go and share the gospel with anybody because, because I, I, don't, I don't have all the answers. And so while you wait until you feel like you have all the answers, the unsaved don't wait for anybody. They just die and go to hell while you wait until you're ready. Listen, you're as ready today as you're ever going to be. Just go and tell them. God loves them. Christ died for them. Give them the message. And, and the Lord will help you, right? Want to give you the words to say? Even if it is, that's a great question. I, I don't know how to answer that. But let me tell you this. Let me tell you what Jesus did for me. Let me tell you my story. Let, let me tell you how he transformed my life. <clears throat> and so, Lord, give me that mindset like your son. See people the way they are. And yes, I, I want to be as ready as I can be. And, and I want, but I, I don't want to wait until, until I've kind of qualified uh, in having answers for every question before I share the gospel with people. I just need to go out there and give it out. Preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. And interestingly, as we go... Um, you know, there are some good things uh, t to be able to share. The evidence for the existence of God. You know, the whole design, designer thing. Those are very helpful things, right? And, and again, they make perfect, perfect sense, don't they? Uh, the, uh, how do I know the Bible is true? The evidence of fulfilled prophecy. Tremendous. No other book is like this book. No other book has such a track record of prophecy being fulfilled historically accurately right down to the very dates and times and all the rest of it. Uh, simple answers to the evolutionists, like where does matter come from? Uh, do you believe in the eternality of matter then? Where did that, how did that get here? If you're going to have a big bang, where did the ingredients come from to make the thing explode? It had to come from somewhere, right? Uh, and so we, we've got arguments. Uh, uh, how does evolution fit with the second law of thermodynamics that everything left to itself falls apart, right? Just like you and I have fallen apart, right? Well, how does that work with evolution when everything's supposed to get better, right? I mean, there's just basic things you can learn. Um, and you know, the interesting thing is that most evolutionists are not experts either. The chances of you meeting an evolutionist who's an expert in his field, when you go witnessing, is pretty remote. The average person has watched David Attenborough on the BBC, and they believe evolution because he said six billion years ago, this thing crawled out of the bucket of slime from the goo to the zoo to you kind of thing. And you, you, you listen to that, and you, you believe that. But they don't know how to articulate their beliefs. When I started talking to this girl at work, I started reading Genesis to prove her wrong. And I would come into work with questions. Where did, where did Cain get his wife from? How, did some, how could somebody be 969 years of age? And, and I was a, an evolutionist in that I had watched telly, and I believed what the BBC said. But I, I didn't, couldn't defend my position. In fact, when she started asking me questions, instead of her being the one who was the ignoramus, I was the one who was the ignoramus. And I realized, I don't have a firm position here. I don't have a leg to stand on. <laughs> Evidence of the uniqueness of Christianity, the empty tomb, things like that. And so it, it is good to, uh, to, to have a, a reason, <clears throat> to have a defense. But again, please don't wait until you've got your act together because unsaved people are not waiting. They're dying, they're perishing. And then he says to every man that asks you, and again, we've asked the question, why is nobody asking? Part of the reason perhaps is that we don't spend a lot of time with unsaved people. We spend a lot of time with the saints, but how many unsaved friends do you have? How many unsaved people do you have into your home? One of the things uh, my wife and I have done uh, over the years is we've, uh, when we first came to this country from the UK, 
uh, we used to really dislike Thanksgiving and Christmas because everybody got together with their families and we were left on our own. And we, I, I've never felt more lonely in all my life in the holiday period, just us. And everybody else is doing the family thing. So we've made a decision and we said to our kids, you know, when, if they're working somewhere or whatever, if there's any strays that have nowhere to go to th at Thanksgiving, bring them to us, right? If there's any strays out there at Christmas, bring them to us. We'll, we'll do a meal for them and we'll have them. So it, you never know quite who's going to be around the table at Thanksgiving. <clears throat> and we've had all kinds of people. I had a, a, a guy, um, he was a, a doctor of psychology. He had MS, and uh, he came uh, to our home. One of our girls uh, was working uh, with him, and she had invited him to come. And uh, we, t we tell the girls, when we invite them, we're just going to be who we are. We're not going to change. You know, we're going to do devotions at the table. We're going to pray for the food. We're just going to be who we are, and that's the way it's going to be. But they're welcome to share the food and the atmosphere of home and all this kind of stuff. And the first time this guy came, uh, he said to us, he said, well, he said, I have never heard that for years. He said, I remember my dad used to read the Bible at the dinner table. And it really spoke to him. The third time he came, before he left at the door, he said, Mike, he said, next time we get together, I want to ask you a question about faith. Isn't that interesting? He asked the question, I want to ask you a question about faith. And what I'm saying is that if we live out the Lordship of Christ, people will begin to ask the question. They will. And of course, part of living out the Lordship of Christ is showing the love of Christ. And Jesus was called the friend of sinners. This man eateth and drinketh with sinners. Boy, aren't you glad that he does? <laughs> but he does. And so that, that mindset of eating and drinking with sinners, that mindset of, of having unsaved people into your home and round your table. And we've had uh, homosexuals at our meal table. Um, uh, we've told them, you know, in respect our position, you're welcome in our home and we'll feed you, but you just reckon we behave yourself, right? <laughs> That's what we, but we've had them in our home. It's been amazing. And so, again, to everyone that asks you, let, let's be the kind of people that people want to ask us, what is it that is different about you? You live in such a way that you cause people to ask a reason. And then he says a reason for the hope that's in you. And it's interesting, isn't it, that the Bible is clear that unbelievers have no hope. Ephesians 2, reminding the believers in Ephesus of their past life in verse 11 and 12, he says, Wherefore, remember that you, being in time past Gentiles in the flesh, who were called on circumcision by that which is called circumcision in the flesh, made by hands, that at the time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. And so the question is, somebody's going to ask you a reason for the hope that is in you. So do they see that hope? In a world that increasingly seems to be hopeless, do they see hope in you? Why do we have hope? Because although the future looks pretty bleak, it doesn't for us, right? We know the one who holds the future in his hand, right? And, and we, we know what the future holds for us because we've believed the gospel of hope. 
<clears throat> Paul talks to the Pharisees and he talks about that the reason that I've been arrested is because of the hope and resurrection of the dead. That's why I'm called into question. Titus 1-2, in hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. Isn't that wonderful? The, the God who cannot lie. Why do we have such hope? Because we believe the God that cannot lie and therefore can never break his promises. And he's promised to us eternal life through faith in his son, the Lord Jesus and that's a great hope, isn't it? It's a confident hope. It's not a maybe iffy kind of thing. We have hope, but the world doesn't have hope. And then he says, sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. Be ready always to give an answer to everyone that asks you for a reason of the hope that's in you. And he says, with meekness and fear. How do we communicate this hope? It's not with arrogance and cockiness with meekness and fear. Meekness is strength under control. We're, from, we're actually coming from a position of strength, not from a position of weakness, but we, it's under control. We, uh, we're not cocky and arrogant. Uh, fear, kind of a reverence for God as we go about our business. So could I say this, that how we communicate is also important, not just what we communicate. Right? There was give an answer for the hope that's within you, but the way you give the answer is also important with meekness and fear. This, sometimes you can win an argument and lose the person you're seeking to win because your attitude is anything but loving, compassionate, meek. It's cocky and arrogant. We knew a man in England, and he was a Jehovah's false witness. And he had been involved with the Jehovah's Witnesses for many years and was very active on the doors. And he had met many a Christian on the door. And he'd argued with many a Christian on the door. And he really didn't like Christians because of the, the lack of love that he perceived from them. And yet this man came to know the Lord Jesus as his personal savior, because there was one house that he visited, and the couple there were believers in the Lord Jesus, and they weren't cocky, they weren't arrogant. In fact, they didn't even want to argue with him. They would look at him and they would say, we just want you to know we love you, we care for you, we're praying for you that you might come to know our Savior like we know him. And he couldn't get this couple out of his mind. He'd go away and he'd be banging on doors and, and all this kind of stuff as faithful as he could to that system, but he couldn't ever stop remembering the compassionate love of this couple. And eventually he went back to them and he said, tell me what I need to know. And they had the joy of leading this man to Jesus Christ, and now he's just as zealous on the doors as he ever was, but he has a message. And that message is that Jesus is the eternal Son of God who came into the world to save sinners. And my New Testament tells me this, love never fails. Where arguments might fail, where devastating uh, kind of logic might fail, love never fails. Love wins. And so what he's saying is this, Christian, you do the work of an evangelist, and let me tell you how to do it. First of all, it starts with your personal surrender to the claims of Jesus Christ, set apart Jesus as Lord. And once you've done that, then he says, you'll be ready because you'll want to tell people about him. You'll be ready always, ever ready, to give an answer. And you'll be expecting 
that people are going to start asking. <laughs> but you won't wait for them to ask. You'll tell them anyway. But you'll be ready when they ask. And you'll be able to articulate in a loving, gracious way the reason for the hope that is within you. Not with haughtiness and arrogance, cleverness, cockiness, with meekness and fear. And you keep doing that, doing the work of an evangelist, preaching the word. And one of these days, this season's going to change. And there'll be a massive ingathering of souls. And you'll be part of reaping that harvest. Christian, we have such a hope, don't we? The world out there is so sad, hopeless, and we have the message of hope. Let's give this message of hope in a loving way, a compassionate way, because we have a compassionate Savior. May the Lord encourage us to do the work of an evangelist with these thoughts. Thank you for your attention. Tim, are you coming up here?